John. John the Evangelist. John. John the Baptist. We're going to put them together this morning. So in order to keep us from getting confused, I know you would, but I do. So this is for self-help and not help you. I'm going to refer to John the Baptist the best I can, strictly as the Baptist. And that may way well, maybe I won't get him confused with John, the author of our text this morning. John chapter 1, starting in verse 29. Here, how John tells a really wonderful story. The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him, and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore I came baptizing with water. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. Again, on the next day, John stood with two of his disciples, John's disciples, and looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned, and seeing them following, said to them, What do you seek? They said to him, Rabbi, which is translated teacher. Where are you staying? And he said to them, Come, come and see. They came and saw where he was staying and remained with him that day. Now it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. And he brought him, Peter, to Jesus. Now when Jesus looked at him, he said, You are Simon, son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated a stone. It's the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The first chapter of John is very much like the pilot episode of a television series. Think back eight months ago to when we all got caught up in Bluff City Law. And that opening episode, and then the next couple of episodes, where we learned about the characters, who they were. And over the ten weeks, we watched them grow and progress. But in the first episode, not just in Bluff City Law, but most any new show, the writers and the directors of that show want to introduce all the main characters. And when we watch a new pilot show, what we learn about the main characters in the first episode helps us and allows us to understand them for the rest of the time that that show is on the air and we watch and see how they develop. Remember how some of those characters developed from the first episode to the last episode? What's his name? Jimmy Schmitz. I loved his development over those ten episodes. And he developed as a person, and he developed as a voice for social movement. Anyway, so John's story begins with a prologue, and it's kind of a hymn. And we know it, for in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And we know that, but then he gets to verse 19. And when John gets to verse 19 in chapter 1, he begins to identify 
and build on the characters in his gospel. Now, all of the four gospels introduce the Baptist early in their narratives, but John introduces him quite differently than in the other gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, they teach us something and tell us something about John's preaching and his ministry of baptism there in the Jordan River. John skips over all of the Baptist ministry or that part of the Baptist ministry. We don't hear the Baptist denouncing the religious leaders and calling them, what did he call them? Broods of vipers. John didn't, uh, the Baptist didn't pull any punches. We don't hear the Baptist denouncing the religious leaders and he skips over his thunderous preaching. And we don't hear anything about his hippie garb and his strange diet. That's just not what John puts in there. John's beginning assume that's John the writer now. We're going to go get him confused with the Baptist. Sure as shooting. John's beginning assumes that we know that the Baptist had created a stir. He had created a buzz. And John begins his story with this group of religious leaders asking the Baptist point one. Who are you? Who are you? They know, they're bound to know what the Baptist has said and what he has done, but they want to know who it is that's saying what and doing these things. And the Baptist answers their questions by declaring intently what? Who he is not. He doesn't answer who he is who he is not is what he says. He says, I am not the Messiah. Because many Jews were what? They were waiting for a Messiah to bring them back to political power and prominence. Who else was he not? He was not Elijah. Remember, Elijah had been taken up to heaven, but he hadn't died. He didn't actually die. And there were a lot of people that expected Elijah to come back. He is not the Baptist told him, the prophet. Some people were expecting a prophet like Moses. No, the Baptist identifies himself how? Very simply. He identifies himself strictly as a voice calling out there in the wilderness. And he personifies or he embodies those words of Isaiah. He is preparing the way for Jesus and the Baptist wants the religious leaders to know one thing above all else. What the Baptist wanted them to know was that he was not the main character. And then we have the next scene, or maybe perhaps if you want to think of it, the next episode. And the Baptist does what he came to do. What does he do? He identifies Jesus. The scene is kind of confusing because John divides this whole first chapter into several days. And this day is devoted to one dramatic and very important speech by John the Baptist. Other than Jesus himself, we really don't have any knowledge of who else was there on the set, on that stage, with the Baptist. John, the writer, doesn't tell us who hears the Baptist's monologue. Nobody. Nobody responds to the Baptist. Nobody else speaks. Every bit of the focus is on that speech that the Baptist gave. So, if we look at this monologue, this speech that he made, the Baptist gives Jesus his very first title in the narrative that John the writer has written. And it is a favorite title of John's gospel. And the Baptist looks straight at Jesus and he announces, Here, here, 
is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And as we look throughout the rest of the Gospel of John, no one phrase can fully identify Jesus any better than that. This title that has fallen from the Baptist's lips, the Lamb of God, is really the only way to identify Jesus. Now, you know, as well as I do, there are so many titles throughout the New Testament that identify Jesus. And the Lamb of God does one thing special. Because remember, he's here amongst a whole castle of Jews. And calling him the Lamb of God connects Jesus with what? It connects him with the Passover. The Passover that we know back in the book of Exodus. And this phrase, the Lamb, stirs up memories. At the Passover, the people of Israel were spared. You remember from the angel of death just before, just before they escaped from slavery there in Egypt. The Passover is a time of salvation for them, of forming community, and more than anything, of celebrating God's love and God's power. At the Passover feast, each family in Israel was to do what? You remember what each family was to do? They were to prepare a lamb. They were to prepare a lamb for sacrifice. So we see not just in the book of Exodus, in the Old Testament, in the escape from slavery, God providing salvation for his people, but now we see Jesus, the Lamb of God, who does what? Who takes away the sins of the world. Once again, God is providing salvation for his people. So we see who Jesus is, and we know what Jesus does. He takes away the sins of the world, but we've got to look at the world. And when the fourth gospel, when John refers to the fourth gospel, it doesn't refer just to this little group of Jewish people. Jesus had come to take the sin and the darkness, not just from this small group, but from the whole group of God's creation. All the diversity that God made and is still making today, Jesus came for the world. And Jesus does more than just forgive our sin. And this is such good news. Jesus conquers. Jesus conquers sin. Folks, you know, we live in a world full of sin. And we live in a world full of darkness. Sin is around us. We live in it. It touches us. We hear about it all the time. But sometimes, way too frequently, it just erupts and it cascades all over, all over creation in hatred and in violence. And we see horrible pictures on television and in the newspaper of things that happen to innocent people. And we know that there is darkness in the world. Well, John is very intentional and very intent that we the readers and that those folks back then know who Jesus is and what he does. So we got the Baptist identified and what he does. We got Jesus identified, what he does. So now we move on further into this opening episode and we get to a next group of disciples who show up, of our next group that show up, and it's the disciples. And only the book of John, only the book of John tells us that at least some of those disciples that followed Jesus originally were the Baptist's disciples. They were the Baptist disciples. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all write as if Jesus chose his disciples at random. But in John, 
Some of Jesus' first disciples made a shift in their loyalty. And the